And we begin in the middle of March in the year 2004. 2004. It was one year since the U.S. launched its invasion of Iraq. This was just a couple of weeks after John Kerry had swept through the Super Tuesday primary states and become the presumptive Democratic nominee for president. So the general election matchup was set. It was going to be Kerry. It was going to be Bush, George W. Bush, the incumbent president. And President Bush did a gracious and magnanimous thing. He called John Kerry on the phone, called him the night of his big Super Tuesday wins, and congratulated him and said he looked forward to the fight in the fall. And then... Bush's campaign did something that wasn't very gracious and wasn't very magnanimous. They went after Kerry very hard. They went after him on the issue that many voters thought was supposed to be the strength for John Kerry. John Kerry, remember, was a Vietnam war hero. Support for the military, though, is where the Bush campaign started. I'm George W. Bush, and I approve this message. Few votes in Congress are as important as funding our troops at war. Though John Kerry voted in October 2002 for military action in Iraq, he later voted against funding our soldiers. Mr. Kerry. No. Body armor and higher combat pay for our troops. Mr. Kerry. No. Better health care for reservists. Mr. Kerry. No. Wrong on defense. And you knew then it was going to be a pretty long campaign. That was a pretty brutal ad. That was right out of the gate from the Bush campaign. And it was a pretty major statement when you think about it. The campaign of the sitting commander in chief a year into a war accusing his opponent of trying to keep money and body armor and health care from American soldiers. Now, of course, the truth was a lot more complicated than that 30-second ad made it seem. As a senator, Kerry had indeed voted against President Bush's $87 billion request to fund military operations in Afghanistan. Kerry was not alone in doing that. A lot of Democrats, most Democrats, had voted against that. This was their way of showing their displeasure with the president's prosecution of the war itself. But this is the Senate. This is Capitol Hill. This is Congress. It's always more complicated than that. The other part of the story is that Kerry and all of those Democrats had also supported a separate version of the funding bill, a separate version that was paid for by rolling back some of the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy. And shortly after that brutal ad came out from the Bush campaign, John Kerry was at a town hall in West Virginia. West Virginia was still a swing state back in 2004. The issue of the Bush ad came up and Kerry tried to set it straight. And let's keep the record absolutely clear here. Secondly, this is very important. I actually did vote for the $87 billion before I voted against it because I voted for it. Joe Biden and I thought this. Joe and I brought an amendment to the $87 billion and we said this should be paid for now, not adding to the deficit. And the way we should pay for it is say to the wealthiest 1 or 2 percent of Americans, instead of accepting $690 billion of tax cuts over the course of the next 10 years, wouldn't you just be willing in the spirit of patriotism and sacrifice to just take $600 billion over the next 10 years? And you know what? The president said no. The Republicans voted no. The Democrats voted yes. We didn't get. And by the way, at issue here, it was not just funding for Afghanistan. It was also funding for operations in Iraq, Iraq and Afghanistan. And obviously it was Iraq that in 2004 was the very politically contentious issue in this country. So anyway, the Bush campaign puts that ad up when John Kerry becomes George W. Bush's general election opponent. John Kerry goes uh, playing a little defense on it. That is his attempt to take the issue out of play. That was a, maybe a decent argument there from the uh, then presumptive Democratic president presidential nominee. He was saying Democrats favor shared sacrifices. That was his message. He's saying, I fought for a war funding bill that would have made the wealthy share the burden of this war. That's the message John Kerry was trying to take there. That's what he said. If you played the whole thing in full, as we just did. But unfortunately for Kerry, all anyone for the rest of history was ever going to hear was this. I actually did vote for the $87 billion before I voted against it. And that is the kind of killer, devastating soundbite that political ad makers live for. Somebody in the Bush campaign was watching John Kerry at the town hall that day, heard that line, isolated it, and knew they had an ad. That was an ad that echoed through that entire campaign. More than a decade later, it's an ad we still talk about. 
And two days after that, John Kerry said it. The Bush campaign added that soundbite to its ad about Kerry voting against the funding. And the Bush campaign, as we say, they spent the rest of the campaign saying that John Kerry was nothing more than a flip-flopper. You remember the 2004 campaign. You remember how that went. And Democrats, at least those with the inner with the knowledge of the inner workings of the Senate, well, they knew what John Kerry had meant when he said he had voted for the funding before he voted against it. He was trying to make a nuanced point about legislative process. Kerry himself had tried to repeatedly explain what he meant there. But again, the soundbite, it was so clear, it was so simple, it was so easy to understand. The damage was done and the damage was profound. That sentence came to define John Kerry. When you're running for president, that's what this example shows. When you're running for president, when you say something the wrong way, It'll create an entirely new and entirely different story. And it will drown out anything and everything that you actually meant to say. Any substance, any nuance, any other point you're trying to communicate. Say something the wrong way. Say it in just the right way, the wrong way, and it will come to define you. This happens in every presidential campaign. It certainly happened in 2004. But until this year, it had never really happened on a nearly daily basis. But now this year, we have, the we have the Republican nominee, Donald Trump, who seems to have made a strategy out of saying things that will make news for their inartfulness or for their inflammatory nature. His word choice itself becomes the news on an almost daily basis, no exception the past week. ISIS is honoring President Obama. He is the founder of ISIS. He's the founder of ISIS. Okay. He's the founder. He founded ISIS. And I would say the co-founder would be Crooked Hillary Clinton. Co-founder, Crooked Hillary Clinton. Now, obviously, when the Republican nominee for president of the United States calls the sitting president the founder of a major terrorist group, it's going to get a lot of attention. It was such an outlandish claim, the media really hasn't been sure exactly what to do with it. Several outlets have gone the straightforward route of fact-checking the claim, PolitiFact giving it a pants-on-fire rating, for instance. But that seems maybe like it misses the point. Donald Trump is doing something here besides just a simple misstatement of fact. This is much bigger what he's doing here. It's hard to imagine that Donald Trump is consciously creating an alternate history in which President Obama held some kind of formal meeting and said, we're creating a terror group called ISIS. Trump is probably referencing a somewhat mainstream Republican argument about the Obama administration's culpability in the rise of ISIS. One can make a reasonable argument along those lines. And in fact, this morning, General Michael Hayden, the former Deputy National Intelligence Director, the head of the CIA under George W. Bush, he responded to Trump's comments by doing just that. Choosing those words corrupts the dialogue, uh, corrupts what should be a, a very serious dialogue. W look, Willie's right. I mean, the actions of the Obama administration in withdrawing from Iraq, going to zero, and we've talked about this on previous shows, actually set the conditions for the recovery of al-Qaeda in Iraq, which then, became, which then became ISIS. So there's a very powerful case to be made. But, but when Mr. Trump uses this language to make that case, two or three things happen. Uh, number one, he, he inflames the debate, and we don't need the flame. We need cold, rational discussion. He insults his audience. He, he goes to these code words to make a fairly valid point and, and why does he do that? Does he not think that his audience could not accept the slightly more complex, the slightly more reasoned message that this president made serious mistakes that led to the creation right. of ISIS? Why does he put it this way? So there you have it. At the beginning of that answer from Michael Hayden, you may not agree with it. You may think he's wrong. You may want to argue it with him. But what Michael Hayden did there was lay out a reasonably argument, argued critique of the Obama administration's foreign policy, specifically in regards to ISIS. That's what Michael Hayden did there. He showed how it's possible to do that. 
But that's not what Donald Trump did. Donald Trump's comments not making headlines because of their nuance, not making headlines because of his specific critiques. They're making headlines because of his language, because of his word choice, because of his blunt statement that the president of the United States is the founder of ISIS. That's the only thing making news here, not the argument, the wording of the argument. There are a lot of things that are frustrating to Republicans about Donald Trump. He says lots of outrageous, lots of unacceptable things, many of which seem to stem from nothing more than personal vendettas. But it's got to be extra frustrating to Republicans that even when Trump tries to make one of the Republican establishment's decently crafted attacks on the Obama administration and by extension on Hillary Clinton, even when he sets out to do that, even when he claims that that's what he's trying to do, he ends up coming up with some crazy sounding choice of words that becomes in and of itself the story. And even when Trump's allies, people who want him to win this election, people who want to give him the benefit of the doubt, people who want to help him try to craft a winning message in this campaign, even when they hear him say that and they try to walk him back into a more reasonable posture, one more within the acceptable limits of the normal political debate in this country, even when they try to do that, he will still stick by the rhetoric. Here he is this morning with conservative radio host Hugh Hewitt. Last night you said the president was the founder of ISIS. I know what you meant. You meant that he created the vacuum. He lost the peace. No, I meant he's the founder of ISIS. I do. He's the most valuable player. I give him the most valuable player award. I give her too, by the way. But he's not sympathetic to them. He hates them. He's trying to kill them. He was the founder. His the way he got out of Iraq was the that was the founding of ISIS. Well, that I you know I have a saying, Donald Trump. uh, The the mnemonic mnemonic device I use is every liberal really seems so so sad. E is for Egypt. L is for Libya, S is for Syria, R is for Russia, reset. They screwed everything up. You don't get any argument from me, but by using the term founder, they're hitting with you on this again. Mistake? No, it's no mistake. Everyone's liking it. I think they're liking it. I give them the most valuable player award. Uh, and I give it to him, and I give it. I gave a co-founder to Hillary. I don't know if you heard that. Yeah, I did. I did. I played it. I just I gave I, her the co-founder. I know what you're arguing. You not, let me ask you: Do you not like that? Uh, I don't. I think I would say they created. They they lost the peace. They created the Libyan vacuum. They created the vacuum into which ISIS came, but they didn't create ISIS. That's what I would say. Well, but let, I, I, I disagree. All right, Without, that's okay. I mean, with his bad policies, that's why ISIS came about. That's true. If he would have done things properly, you wouldn't have had. That's ISIS. true. Therefore, he was the founder of ISIS. Uh, uh, that's I just use different language to communicate better. Let me close with this because I know I'm keeping you long and hope's going to kill me. But they wouldn't talk about your language and they do talk about my language, right? Oh, good point. Good point. Well, whether consciously or not, Donald Trump may have given away the game at the end of that exchange. You heard it right there. Hugh Hewitt says that he, Hugh Hewitt, would talk about the issue of ISIS differently than Trump has been. He lays out a politically reasonable argument on the subject, and Trump replies, quote, but they wouldn't talk about your language, and they do talk about my language. Donald Trump appears to want his language to be the headline. He wants his language to be what people are talking about. Maybe because for Donald Trump, being talked about is the whole ball game. Sure enough, at his rally in Florida tonight, Trump repeated his line that President Obama is the founder of ISIS. Everyone has agreed from the moment that Trump entered this race that he knows how to get media attention. The question has always been whether he can use that media attention as a means to an end or whether media attention itself is the end. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.